Even a few decades ago, mothers were most interested in making their daughters marriageable. My mom sent me to etiquette school and most of my girlfriends were sent as well. If I gained a few pounds, she would be like, listen, you're getting fat. This is what mothers should be doing, not worshiping their girls simply for being born female. They need to be honest with their daughters about how very important their looks and demeanor are. So it is important. I will absolutely agree with Blonde on this, but I will say you can very quickly, especially as a mother, go over in that. I know people who every time, I'm, I'm speaking Chinese women, every time they call their mom, which means you got fat, or like, why didn't you watch your weight? So they, they don't look forward to calling their mom because every time they call their mom, their mom's talking shit about their weight. <laughs> It's all about a balance. Men are physical creatures, so yes, we care a lot about that. But besides that, there are other things that Blonde talks about later that I really want to emphasize to anyone watching. It's all about balance and moderation, so don't go too into watching your looks because then you're just going to be one of those, what do you call them, gym thoughts or whatever. All you're going to care about all your life is your looks, and of course looks fade. So let's keep watching. There's a lot of good stuff that Blonde talks about besides caring about your looks. And they should also be teaching them that a career is secondary to finding a husband unless they exhibit an extraordinary talent. See, in modern Western society, saying that is quote unquote disrespectful or saying that is quote unquote too controversial. I mean, that's part of what the James Damore memo talked about and that's part of what got him fired is saying, hey, you know, maybe some women are just more fit to be in the house or be wives, but we can't say that nowadays. I mean, starting with second wave feminism in the West, we couldn't really say that, but now saying that, I mean, Blonde has a lot of courage saying that. My aunt, my mom's older sister, once she married my uncle, so my mom's older sister's husband, she was a housewife all her life, and she made the house just freaking rocking, and they had like six kids. They freaking had six kids under the one child policy. You know, you need a you need a special type of woman to be able to do that. This is one example, but some women are really good at making the house the best possible for the family. This shouldn't be something controversial. This should be something that people just admit. Men and women are different. Some women with their dispositions are good to be at home and be great mothers and be great family. And I can't believe that it's gotten to the point in the West where I have to say that and feel a little bad that someone's gonna take offense. You know, if you take offense, go away. But seriously, we need to discuss these things. And that's why I'm reviewing this video by Blonde in the Belly of the V because she's talking honestly about this. So all of this made me think, what can Western women do to start providing value to men again? I suppose that if they don't care, it may not even matter, but it seems that the journey for self-improvement in Western women has to start with the simple questions. What do men want and what do they need? It's very interesting because this is how the PUA movement basically started. They're like, okay, there's a disconnect between what women want and what they say. So let's figure out what they want. So maybe if this, I call this fifth wave feminism, blonde in the belly of the beast, Lauren Southern, Roman millennial, these type of women. Maybe if this fifth wave feminism continues, you're going to have reverse PUA going on where women, they're like, okay, let's figure out what men want. And since so many men are just opting out, let's try to bring them back. So this is so funny that, okay, let's go back to the fundamentals. Let's find out what men want. Okay, how do we give it to them? How do we get them hooked, etc.? Of course, men want a mate that is thin, attractive, fertile. I can't even believe I have to say this, but here we are. Women think that men have ridiculous standards for beauty, but when I've seen friends and family choose their wives, not a one of them was worried about her being a perfect 10. What they wanted across the board was a hot enough woman who had all of the other more intangible characteristics that they want. See, that's the thing about attraction. You spend enough time with someone as long as she says hot enough. So as long as your body's not repulsive and you have a lot of other good things about you, attraction will inevitably spark you, you put it in kind of a contained, not a vacuum, but you put it in kind of a contained, controlled medium where there's not too much outside stimulus, too much outside influence. That's what dating is, right? You spend a lot of time together. You basically bubble yourself up. That's basically what dating is. So all you have to do really is not be completely physically repulsive 
and have some other good personality traits and you spend enough time together, it'll happen. If there's certain personality slash other dispositional things that are not there, you're not gonna be able to stand each other enough to have attraction develop. And then if the physical things aren't there, there's not even gonna be that initial interaction. So I'm just rephrasing what she's saying in a different way, maybe in a more mansplaining way, if you wanna use that word, but that's basically what she's saying. If fat single moms in America can make all of these demands and have a totally inflated sense of self-worth, imagine how much worse and how much more entitled a stunning Western woman is. She is likely not going to accept anything less than a seven-figure salary and washboard abs, or she'll feel like she's been gypped. She just absolutely explained why men go their own way. If the top 20% of women are not gonna go for 80% of guys because they think these guys are quote unquote inferior or not dateable or not on their level, then there is gonna be maybe a small percentage, maybe 20% of these 80% of guys that get passed up will just say, well, screw it. So suddenly you have 16% of guys who are just like, it's not worth it. I'm walking away. And do you blame them? I think Blonde in the Belly of the Beast is understanding this and her solution is saying, okay, well, maybe we just collectively lower what we've been taught we need to expect in a guy and we start from the fundamentals. Well, that's gonna be a little hard. If you've been taught all your life you're the princess, you deserve everything, right? You deserve a guy with rock hard abs, who's caring, who can come home on time, who also makes a seven figure income. And when he's at home, he's a beast in the bed. And then he can also serenade you with six different instruments in seven different languages. I'm just trolling, but men are like, why? What if I just develop a few good hobbies for myself, not for her? And why, why, why do I even care what they think and what can get me quote unquote once in a while a poontang. So women need to realize that men aren't generally holding unrealistic expectations. They're not really deciding if you're in the top 1% of all women. It's more like a baseline level of minimum attractiveness that has to be achieved. This is great news for a sweet, above average looking, wholesome girl. That's the marriage zone. Just have a healthy lifestyle and work out. You don't need to go crazy. As far as other things that men want, I used to think that they were so complicated, but really I think that all they want is for their basic needs to be met, for you to support them and in whatever way you can to make their lives easier. You know, I have this Cambodian acquaintance and he's one of these Asian guys that tries to act very black and there's nothing wrong with that, right? This is America, you can be whatever you want. But he's always like, he dates the most physically not attractive women, but he's always like this. He's like, yo, dog, man. And forgive me for my bad impression of an Asian trying to be black. You know, I'm like the farthest away from that you could be. But he's like, yo, dog, man. My lady, she just feeds me well, dog. Oh, she can cook. And sometimes that's all you need. He's not the most attractive guy, but he sure has swag. Like he's got the attitude. So in his mind, he's like a 10. The women he's dating are definitely not tens, they're probably fives or fours, but why does he date them? Why does he love them? Because dog, they can cook, man. So what Blonde in the Belly of the Beast is saying is true. You have to understand, a lot of times, if you just meet a man's basic needs, he needs someone to hold once in a while, he needs someone to cook, he needs someone to talk to him and not judge, and he needs someone who can listen, it's like, there's such basic needs and it's funny that there's such a disconnect nowadays between what the female population think men want and what men actually want. We're not that complicated like Blonde in the Belly of the Beast says. Of course people like me are more complicated, that's why we're so weird, but the majority of men, like 80% of men are not like Aspie in here. This sounds like a small thing, right? But this is not natural for Western women. We're taught to outright reject the concept of submission, and in turn, it has created two generations of women that are defiant, resent their husbands, and demand egalitarianism, despite it being the very thing that kills their sexual attraction to their partner. Men need support, emotional and logistical. They need sex, they need food, and they need to work. Of course, that isn't all they need, but it's a pretty good start. Because dog, they can cook, man. The job of a good woman, and she knows this, 
is to do whatever she can to provide the necessities to minimize the burden of cooking and housework and to help create a stable home life so that the man can be really well rested and mentally prepared to work as hard as he can. Now, some men will protest this point and say, well, ultimately, your goal is to have men go back to the plantation, be these disposable utilities. You know, you get these women who help them better become disposable utilities. So I see many people raising that point. And could you blame them? We're in an age where you can accomplish more and more by yourself. I don't see any reason not to think this way that, hey, it's done. No more men just being disposable utilities for society. We're in an age where I think in 20 to 30 years, men will be able to have children on their own. They won't need a woman. They won't need a womb. They'll be able to find egg donors. I mean, they're already egg donors, but maybe there's going to be a way to just create an egg from... You don't even have to go... In. Right now, it's really intrusive to get an egg from a woman. You really have to go in. That's what they pay so much. But in the future, it might be as simple as how men donate sperm. You just do it in a cup or something like that. And so artificial wombs are already being developed. And you know that there's pretty fairly realistic sex spots and all that stuff. And all this stuff to take care of the carnal desires. So on top of that, we have the internet. We have all these tools to learn. We have so much. We have food delivery services. I mean, it's more and more possible for a man to just live happily by himself. She's advocating, yeah, you know, give men these things that have traditionally existed so that they can keep working hard, etc., etc., etc. It's going to upset a few men who are like, well, I don't want to be part of this system anymore. I just want to be left alone. I just want to live my life. Maybe I'll contribute if I have something to contribute, but I just want to be left alone. I don't want to harm anyone. I'll just do my own thing. I assume Blind in the Belly of the Beast is a conservative, so that's something that a lot of libertarians slash a lot of just people, maybe you can call them anarchist minded, just people who are even more liberty minded in all aspects and not just economics would think and refute these sort of conservative viewpoints. I believe that the most important thing a woman can do to avoid indoctrination and a drunken hookup culture, to have time to have a bunch of kids, and to prevent dropping a debt bomb on her future husband is to avoid going to college. Like I mentioned earlier, when I check out some old female acquaintances from college on Facebook, I routinely see things like, fuck all white cishet men. One chick is even Antifa now. And some of these girls were nice, pretty Christian girls from big, wonderful families. Then they turned their carefully handled daughters over to Mizzou, like so many parents in Missouri do, and she comes back a rabid, man-hating, racist feminist, then carries that through at least the next decade. It must be a nightmare for these parents. I did not need to go to Mizzou. It just put me 30 grand in debt, gave me a quasi-worthless degree that chained me to corporate desks, and very nearly indoctrinated me for life with feminist nonsense. I also didn't need to have any number of jobs in finance that I've had. Largely, I was a wage slave that lazily did menial work for an already super wealthy group or individual. I 100% agree that our society needs to examine our higher education bubble. Before you go to college, you really have to figure out is this really what you want? Slash, are you focused enough that you're going to get a good ROI on this education? That's absolutely true. But I think there's we have to break down her. It seems like she's given a very extreme point, but it's not. And we just have to break it down into two arguments. Basically, she's putting two things into one. And I want to split this argument into two because that's really what the crux of it is. So the first thing she's saying about the going to Mizzou and becoming Antifa, et cetera, is that colleges are a place of indoctrination. That's just because it's a safe space and you have all these intellectuals in college who've never stepped into the real world. So it's all these warped views being passed on to these naive students who think their professors know everything. On top of that, there's the fact that students have their own kind of communities and they think, oh yeah, my, my little space radio represents the world, right? So that's part of a problem with college and that's inevitable in society and that's not really a college's fault although college is exasperated to a point that other things other institutions don't as much but I mean churches do it churches do it too the solution to this problem the safe space slash indoctrination problem is that 
as a society, we just have to teach everyone, look, remember, we were founded on the fact that we use information, we use discussion, we use debate, we use civil tools to get to the truth and to make society better. So as long as we teach everyone in this world what our country's about, what our culture's about, and just give them good civics lessons, this could mitigate some of these problems that colleges seem to cause. Now, the second problem that she's describing with her college argument is the fact that people get out of it and they're in debt and they become wage slaves. And I absolutely feel her on that. That's something that if you really want to get into an area and you're happy being a wage slave, then I guess the ROI is fine. But if becoming a wage slave was not your end goal and you have to now become a wage slave because of your college debt, then maybe it's not worth it. So I 100% agree with her on that. But again, you see there's two arguments in this little section and she kind of put it into one and it'll very likely not get processed and digested by a lot of people. So I hope my clarification slash breakdown of her two arguments in one really helps. And for those of you who've ever been treated badly by a company, which basically all of you have if you've worked for a corporate company or even a startup, most startups screw over their employees in the end. Ultimately, it is true. It's better to try to figure out a way to make money without having to work for someone or something that's over your shoulder. And it's not easy. It's not easy. And going to college sometimes doesn't help because it puts you in debt and then it gives you this degree that now brands you, right? It's like, uh, uh, this person's in finance. Oh, or, or this, this person is a political science major. Why isn't he in politics? Blah, 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 blah. Think more and think hard before you decide on going to college. I always tell people, and I've said this in many of my other talks, Take a few years off potentially, then go to college or you get accepted by college, you can still take a year off, do it. There really is no pride in that kind of work, even though people were telling me the whole time that this is what I needed to do to provide value to society. I was bitterly depressed, had no idea why, because I thought I was fulfilling my greatest destiny. And no one was telling me, look, this is a waste of your life. Find a good man, settle down. There's no happiness for women in corporate life. That's brutally honest. But what about entrepreneurs though? Or what about some other type of non-corporate but still service-based type of job? Like being a doctor, being a nurse, or something like that. But it's crazy. She has the balls to say this kind of stuff. I remember, I believe it was a Penn alum or a Harvard alum that wrote this op-ed that generated a lot of controversy in the Ivy League. Because what this alum said was, you know, these four years... You have access to some of the smartest, most full of potential guys. So try to make that a priority. Find a good guy in these four years. I'm going to link you guys the article if I can find it. But it generated so much backlash in the Ivy League. Everyone, I remember people at my school, all the feminist-minded women were just like, screw this woman trying to teach traditional values. What we need to be telling women is the company you're working for doesn't give a shit about you. And more importantly, your career almost certainly doesn't matter. And if you're successful, which will require you to sacrifice much of your femininity, well, at the end of that is an 80-hour work week and a Jamaican nanny raising your babies. And that's if you're lucky enough to meet some effeminate man that's still lost in the myth of egalitarianism to impregnate you at age 40. Again, so brutally honest. If you've seen my video about marriage rates, it looks like people are just delaying marriage. And there's a lot of bad things about that. One, the sperm and the egg are not as healthy after 35. So if you delay your marriage and you delay having kids, your goal, of course, being raising healthy kids, then you put your kids at a disadvantage. You're older, you don't have as much energy, and genetically, your kids probably aren't as healthy. And of course, you two have probably had more sexual experiences, so you're more cynical in general, so it's harder to keep the marriage together. It also reminds me of this movie called Idiocracy, if you guys have ever seen Idiocracy, it's a great movie. And basically all the not smart people are busy breeding since let's say 14. And all smart people, they, they could barely have one kid and eventually after thousands of years, society just, that kind of reminds me of that too. The blondes trying to call out women for trying to do career and have success and have a family and have a beautiful kid, etc. 
I know so few women with remarkable intellectual abilities that translate to a specific and meaningful career, at least meaningful enough that it offsets having kids. I can see why this is going to upset a lot of people because on the surface, it sounds like she's saying women are not as smart as men, but that's not really what she's saying. What she's saying is if you're going to compete with men in this sort of career slash make a difference for broad society type of thing, the distribution of women that can get to that level of men are different. Just like if men were to compete with women on certain things like being a good parent or being a good mother or whatever, the distribution's also different. If you're like Ann Coulter, you very well may be the kind of person that can contribute more to the world through their work than through having children. But much, much fewer women are actually of this intellectual caliber and skill set than is generally believed by women. See, Ann Coulter's cool, but when you use Ann Coulter as an example, you could alienate a lot of people. So to Blonde, here's what I recommend. Next time, come up with a list of people who are leaders, not just intellectual leaders, but leaders in other fields. So talk about Marie Curie, female scientist. Talk about Cleopatra, female statesman. There's a lot of other people like this who are extremely good examples of exceptions. If you just mention Ann Coulter, automatically to anyone who's not a conservative or libertarian, they'll tune out. They'll be like, well, fuck you. You're pandering towards this type of person. List a few more exceptions, but still mention that they're exceptions. Ella Fitzgerald, my lady Ella, man. Almost all women would be happier being mothers and will feel confined and beaten down by their careers. And God help them when they realize that they will never be mothers. So if chicks are going to stop going to college, it isn't going to help them unless they use this time wisely. 18, 40 years ago or so looked really different than 18 today. Our generation specifically has horrible arrested development, both genders, and if women want to improve their value, they have to start demonstrating value at a younger age. So if you're a teenage girl, don't adopt this attitude that you have all the time in the world. You really don't. Start learning how to be an excellent cook, how to control emotional outbursts, how to really listen to somebody. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Schools nowadays treat kids like kids instead of saying, okay, let's prepare you to be an adult. So this is how you become an adult. In high school, middle school, etc., people just aren't treated as adults, which you shouldn't. But you should be treated as, okay... It's my job as a teacher, it's my job as an administrator to help equip you with the tools to become an adult. And most of our classes don't do it. Where's the finance classes? Where's the etiquette classes? Where's the emotional control classes like she's talking about? Where's the how to be assertive classes? Where's the how to do a house party classes? You know, these are great skills. How to organize parties, how to organize get-togethers, how to do, how to community build. These are all skills that we're expected to kind of learn in the real world, but they should really be teaching us this starting from a young age. And maybe this is where the family comes in. This is where the family teaches. And unfortunately, our families are so busy working. It's most family, both parents are working. So the family doesn't have time to teach the kids these things or other families are divorced and broken up. So then they really don't have time to teach the kids these things. But these are all skills that as a society, maybe I'm putting too much emphasis on schools, but as a society, we should teach people starting from a young age. So like she says, if these women decide, okay, well, let's be housewives or whatever, they really are prepared and equipped to be housewives or whatever role they want to be by the time they're quote unquote adults. I will say though that this arrested development thing is not the right way to describe it because the male and female brains don't actually completely mature until the 20s. But that being said, that's no excuse not to strive to be the best that you can when whatever age you are. And I think that's what Blonde ultimately says. So I agree with her on that. Start educating yourself on political matters. Read for pleasure. Just make yourself better. Genuinely a better, more useful, more learned person. Just because I don't want you to go to college, it does not mean that I want you to be uneducated. I want every woman to be like Elizabeth Bennett. And she was not this meek, stupid wallflower. She was dignified, self-possessed, articulate, educated, yet still feminine. I just want you to take your education into your own capable hands. I think Blonde makes a very great point, And I don't know if my extrapolation of her point is actually what she's saying. But part of being a housewife and part of what got a lot of Western women to disdain this housewife role is the fact that, hey, if you're busy 
just taking care of kids, cooking, making the house the best you can, maybe there's another part of your brain that's not being stimulated, which is a valuable critique because we as humans, men, women, we have the cortex here. We strive information. The argument for, hey, being a housewife for a woman is not enough completely gets refuted by blind if you follow what she's saying, which is learn to be intellectually curious. Learn to be just curious and always learning and growing. So even if your woman is a housewife, you're still growing. You're still always learning. So that way you keep up that intellectual stimulation slash stimulation of other areas of your brain. And so you're not just, oh, I'm boring housewife life and the only thing I can do is uh, well, occasionally I'll go to the gym and then I'll gossip with all my other housewives, you know, like the desperate housewife type of role. We have this live in the moment type of mentality where life should always be fun. Oh, every day of your life should be so different and so valuable. But the truth is, the reality is, and this is a hard red pill that men and women have to accept is that most of life is boring. Most of life is uneventful. And if you make your life too eventful, the brain adapts. And then it's a treadmill that you can never completely get off of. It's better to have an expectation of a lower baseline because it makes the real true moments of happiness, the real true moments of excitement better. Some people might disagree with me on that. Some people say, no, it's your life. You should travel every weekend, do this, do that, blah, 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 and that's your life. But I think there is a reason why if you look at European cinema, why it's so fucking boring, a lot of those movies they make, and it's because they really believe art imitates life, and they think life, a lot of times, is kind of, eh, right? And their movies kind of demonstrate that. A lot of their movies are just like, eh. I've heard this complaint from many men, and I'm so guilty of this myself, so it's a behavior I really actively try to combat, and that's nagging, and to a lesser degree, sharing unnecessary information with your man. I don't know why we do this, but when my fiance asked me about my day, I can just feel the inane chatter pouring out of my mouth. It's practically involuntary. Nagging is the same kind of thing, the incessant chatter. So what I try to do now to control this, before I say something to him, I try to think, does this convey any necessary information? On average, women say two times more than men do. There's something biological about that, and it's probably this whole gossip, nagging, this talking, is something that helps build communities. It's back in the day, if you look at evolution, you look at how humans developed, men hunted or did the things, women stayed behind. So you can't stay behind with people and hate them. So this excessive chatter caused bonds. It caused things to think about together. It caused things to have a quarter, oh, we, we got our own little things to, oh, you know, th that's how you build relationships. Like she says, start this early because part of the whole nature versus nurture thing is nurture can really work if you make it into a habit. And how do you develop a habit? Through practice, 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 practice. It's not in anyone's nature to become, let's say, a volleyball player. But you become a volleyball player, how? You practice, you practice, 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 and then you become a good volleyball player. With any habit that's not just genetically ingrained in us, it takes practice. So if it is like Blonde says, if it is possible to get women to stop nagging all the time and get women to, hey, have a little bit more empathy, then start teaching this from a young age. I'm not saying it's easy, but hey, let's be hopeful. Along the same lines, ask about his life, his feelings, how he is doing. Everyone likes to talk about themselves, but it shows your man that you support him and that you care about his sacrifices and his work and really try to listen. I know this is hard for your self-important extroverts like me, but try to develop this skill set if it doesn't come naturally to you. He will really appreciate this and feel loved. Just from my personal experience, this is really hard. It's really hard to find people that really care. It's really hard. If you start society on a different path and teach everyone empathy starting from a young age maybe this will be different but i just don't see america getting to the point where people will be able to really sit down and listen again i really just don't see it we're too deep in the rabbit hole of me 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 even if we try to teach the non me 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 we have things like this that will inevitably keep it me 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 unfortunately 
culture affected technology now technology is affecting culture back i just don't see this happening on top of that america is such an extrovert focused country and that itself presents problems because extroverts are all about <laughs> try to teach an extrovert to listen it's a really 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 hard i really want to see blonde's fiance give an honest assessment as to how she's improved being an extrovert and her listening skills because the whole point of how extroverts interact with people is that they have to interact you see they have to interact to listen that's their listening is interacting so you're saying something they're saying something back that's how they're listening it's not you're saying something and they're processing it you see so there's an inherent problem when you have a society that has too many extroverts and a society that emphasizes the exceptional strengths of extroverts you have a society of too many introverts it's bad too look at china china's too introverted man it's or fucking look at japan look at all the weird shit that comes out of japan so it's all a balance let's just create a seastead and then let's just yeah, find the perfect mathematical formula for how many extroverts and introverts we need in this society, how many different types of men and women, etc. And then we put them together and see if this perfect concoction, it's like a recipe, see if this is the perfect recipe for a society works. Atlas shrugged. I asked my fiance for input on this script, what he thinks is the most important thing for women to do or to avoid doing in a relationship. He said that the worst thing a woman can do is insult or emasculate a man in front of his friends. I'm sure we've all seen this a few times. A couple we know gets into a tiff in front of us and the man stands silently looking at his feet or something while the woman berates him in front of everyone. I can only imagine a few more emasculating scenarios than this. So what I'll say on this one is try to be acutely aware of how you treat your significant other in front of his company. Even if you're really pissed, even rightfully pissed, be as cordial as you can and do not air your grievances until you're in the privacy of your own home. I can't tell you how many friends of my parents, man, the wife is in public just like making fun of her husband in front of his face, in front of everyone. And thank goodness my mom never does that, right? That's one great thing my mom does. But a lot of her fucking friends, man, I want to slap them. And it's so emasculating to the men, to the husband. A lot of these wives are very domineering at home. And you look at the husbands and just feel sorry for them. The eyes are the window to the soul. And in these men that their wives berate them in front of everyone, there's this spiritual sadness in the eyes you can just tell by looking at them the husbands are just deep down at heart they're like if i ever get reincarnated i'd rather just be a pig and live 20 years without a woman like that's seriously how the husbands are feeling deep down in their spirit and i don't know if you guys have ever seen this type of emasculated spiritually unhappy look in a man and it's absolutely killing of the soul and i remember noticing it for the first time back in college when i would see some of my parents friends not all of the wives were like bad people it just they developed this bad habit of dissing their husbands or just calling out their husbands in front of everyone and the husbands just out of love or just out of self-pity or maybe out of lack of confidence never understood how to call their wives back out if you're gonna call me i'm gonna call you out if you have friends that are married and any of them where this happens what blonde's talking about look at, look at the husband's eyes but it's not the eyes per se it's the muscles around the eyes that can tell you a lot stay as thin as you can if you gain 50 pounds because you're lazy that's grounds for divorce do not think that because you snagged a man that you no longer have to compete with other women. But that goes for men and women. You always have to be aware that if you're with a person of high quality, they will have other options. You don't want to reduce their quality to control their options. That's sociopathic. I've seen and heard about this before. Men keeping their wives fat and vice versa, that kind of thing. Instead, why wouldn't you want to keep your own value high to compete? I think ultimately it comes back to what is marriage for? is marriage for raising a very healthy family and the men and the women committing to, okay, now all the growth we wanted to do, we'll do it better because we're a team now. I will take my strengths and help you. You will take your strengths and help me. 
and my weaknesses I will overcome with my own help and with your help and yours too. So if that's the definition of marriage, then what Blonde says makes sense. But maybe the reason why she has to emphasize this is that marriage is no longer this anymore. Maybe marriage is out of convenience. Marriage is out of loneliness now. Marriage is out of parasitism. You don't know. This is more an indictment of the institution of marriage than anything that Blonde has to emphasize. Hey, look, keep your value once you're in a marriage. In fact, your value should increase in everything. Your beauty should increase. Your knowledge should increase. Your social standing should increase. Everything should increase. That's what marriage is for. Think about traditionally a marriage, even when it was an arranged marriage. Did anyone expect to get a short end of the deal from the marriage? No. Whether it's an agreement or whether it was just an expectation was that marriage would improve the lives of everyone. Think like that. Think win-win. Always think, what value am I providing this person? What reason am I giving them to stay with me? If the reason is obligation, that isn't going to be a strong enough incentive and things will probably fall apart. In other words, do not have kids before you're ready. Do not have kids to stay in a marriage and make the marriage better. Do not have kids kids and bring these helpless souls into the world for your own fucking egos. Men care about getting their basic needs met and women mostly care about security, emotional and financial. All we really need to do to start mending relations between the genders is to understand these basic things about one another and to start approaching relationships not from a defensive position, but from one of respect and compassion. And most importantly, with the understanding that we must provide real tangible benefits to one another. I'm going to end it here. What I really hope Blonde's talk and my analysis of her talk gets you to do is just to think about it. Think about, hey, is the solution, fuck this shit, let's just walk away. Is the solution, hey, let's keep trying to mend this. Is the solution our current status quo? Hopefully you decide it's not that, of course. But I really want to emphasize to you, she's not right on everything, I'm not right on everything, no one's right on everything. But if we work together and we really keep discussing and debating and talk honestly about this, maybe we'll learn a few things from each other. And that's all I want to do with all these response videos. It's very easy for me to just tell stories, it's very easy for me just to say my views, but if I don't have someone to bounce it off of, it's not as interesting. I hope you find these more interesting. I'm so finding these interesting. You know, she's helping me put some of my thoughts down, and then I'm helping myself put some of my thoughts down. Hopefully, if she sees this, if Blonde, you see this, we continue this debate. We continue this talk because that's what a democratic society needs. So for those of you watching and any of Blonde in the Belly of the Beast audience that finds this, please leave a comment, share this with your friends, start a debate. And not like, you're wrong, you're wrong, fuck you, blah, 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 you liptard, you, you conservative cucks, you know, not like that. Let's just talk. Let's just talk and we'll learn from each other. The most hardcore feminist can learn from the most hardcore MGTOW, just like the most hardcore MGTOW can learn from the hardcore feminist. Although I'm biased, I would say that the most hardcore MGTOW probably can only learn like very teensy stuff from feminists, whereas feminists can learn a lot from MGTOW. Anyways, thank you guys so much. Talk to you guys soon.